Excellent! Hello my friends and welcome to yet another episode of Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A series where I answer questions that you guys asked in last month's video. So all the questions I'm answering today were asked last month, and if you wanted me to answer your questions next month, then put them in the comments section down below. Speaking of last month, look at all the Probing Pauls I've done. That hole's getting pretty deep at this point. Beyond that, there should be timestamps in a pinned comment as well as in the video description, so check that out if you want to jump forward to a question that you find particularly interesting. That said, let's start out this month with the first question, which is from Evolution PR. Uh, asked a couple weeks back, and he says, How would you recommend installing and connecting RGB fans? Planning to move my case to the new Lian Li 011 XL, populate all nine fan spots, but worried about RGB headers, thinking of Lian Li RGB fans as well. Uh, a good question, and one that is sort of the bane of my existence in some situations. I often come to the end of a build, I'm like, oh, it's just about finished, let's just install the fans, and then I realize I've got RGB fans with LEDs that need to be wired up, and it can really be a pain in the butt, because there's different standards, uh, some have different plugs than others, some require a separate control box unit. I would say that the most common thing you're gonna come across is a fan like this with RGB LEDs in this hub or somewhere else, and then you're gonna have two cables running off of it, one just to power the fan, and then you'll have one that uh, is hopefully going to be one of these standard three pin five volt addressable headers. These I think are the most flexible just because they're the most ubiquitous. You find them everywhere. And what you can do with this is just plug it directly into your motherboard to control one fan possibly. Or a lot of these fans are going to come with a splitter that will allow you to connect up multiple to the same header. The way it works is it actually measures the amount of resistance uh, in order to determine how many LEDs are connected up. And that's why you can connect multiple devices up. However, depending on what you're connecting to, there are limitations there. So, so the longest story short is there's really no good way to go about it. Just uh, I would say make sure you get all the same type of fan. Consider getting something like fans that come in a kit, a box like this. This is actually the Lian Li BR digital fans that you might uh, be considering as you mentioned that. These are really nice fans. They have a nice even LED lighting across the center and they stay nice and quiet from my usage of them. They do not have that three pin plug on the end but it does have a proprietary plug or one that Lian Li chose to use that you can connect directly to their control box or there's an adapter that you can use uh, so you can take that plug that they give you and connect it up to the standard three pin plug. Uh, but it might be nice to consider buying a kit of fans that often come in sets of three. That way it has possibly like a hub built in there, possibly a set of various accessories that might seem confusing but that would allow you to connect up to various different types of connection points. But try to stick to plugging in directly to your motherboard if possible. And then if you do go the route of some of the companies that have a more fully fledged ecosystem built in like NZXT I would say with their Hue stuff, uh, Corsair for example with their light loop stuff. Uh, for these you're going to need an accessory like a lighting node pro to connect up to or a commander pro but that said the trade-off there is that these will then connect via USB uh, and then you can use the Corsair software which might provide you more flexibility with different lighting configurations compared to just some of the standard motherboard software that's out there for that standard three pin connection. Again though you have the situation where you're going to have one plug coming off for the power, one plug coming off for the LEDs, and then this you're going to need to plug into something different, and then that you're going to need to plug into your USB header on your motherboard. I've considered trying to do a sort of whole look at the LED situation uh, and I just keep putting it off because I feel like there's more and more stuff that uh, keeps being introduced but if you really want to simplify things assuming you have the proper mounts for them I think part of the reason my video on uh, this master fan SF360R uh, which is a set of three fans that are all connected together was maybe somewhat popular because um, anyone who's dealt with it knows there is a significant amount of convenience that's introduced by this just having three fans all wired up to net together so you just have that one plug for the LEDs to plug in and worry about. Um, so maybe consider that as well. Just again, these, these come in 240 and 360 configurations, so you need to have the mount in your case as well. Moving on to our next question though from Gavin Broderick. Uh, hey Paul, watch your videos a long time, still love them to this day. Thank you very much, Gavin. Uh, do you think the benefits of RTX are enough to justify not getting the Navi cards? Uh, I gave a long answer to my first question. I'm gonna give a short answer to this one, no. Right now, I would say no. Yes, there are a few games that have some eye candy that you can turn on. You can look at AB comparisons and be like, oh yes, that's prettier. I think practically speaking for most gamers who just wanna get a good frame rate and play the game that they're playing, 
it's not doing a whole lot. There are not really any games out there that are a game that you must have the RTX features in order to play it in the right way. I think RTX is nice. I think ray tracing is good. I think it's technology that should continue to be integrated into games. And I think we're gonna get hardware support on the AMD side as well. I just don't think we're anywhere close to requiring ray tracing or RTX support uh, for your hardware, your chosen hardware in order to play your games properly. So I veer more towards just the raw performance of the cards, what's going to get you the best frame rate in the games you're playing, what's going to give you the most bang for the buck. And there, I think the Navi uh, GPUs 5700 and 5700 XT actually have a lot going for them. So definitely keep them in mind, compare them to the NVIDIA offerings that are in the same price range, and don't make RTX your selling point. I think that's what, a what NVIDIA tried to do when they launched the RTX cards, and I think that's why it fell flat, is because it's not really required. Next up is a comment from Amaretik. Uh, and this is something I decided to follow up on because it's something that I've tried recently and I wanted to share with you guys. So this is kind of a QA, and a but maybe not really. I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, but anyway, related to last month's video where I talked about activating Windows in various ways and how it should be done, he just moved Windows 10 from one PC to another, intended to do the reactivation using the digital license. It said Microsoft servers couldn't be reached or couldn't be activated. Please try again later. No reason given. Uh, finally, he ended up digging up his old Windows 7 key that he had upgraded to Windows 10 from and it reactivated for him. So to be clear, in the responses from last month's probing Paul, I had people who said, I had a 10 year old system, Intel system that I just took the drive from and installed it in a AMD system that I just built and Windows 10 just recognized all the hardware and it worked great. I had other people who were like, I did that, took an old drive with old Windows 10, put it in a new system and it worked, but it still acts weird. It hangs sometimes. Not all the programs launch the way they should. This is the reason why I recommend people just go with a clean install if you're trying to choose one way or the other. Take a bit of time and back up all of your files. But when it comes to activating Windows in particular, that is something that people potentially want to uh, get past. Uh, maybe not having to pay for an additional Windows 10 license is something that might be useful for you. So what Emeritik did here was originally had a Windows 7 installation, updated it to Windows 10 probably when they were doing it for free, and what that should do is give your system a new Windows 10 license that's unique to your system, but then when you tried to reactivate it, it wouldn't work. Went back to the original Windows 7 key, in input it, and Microsoft was like, okay, we'll reactivate your software. To that end, I'm sure lots of you guys have stuff lying around like this, right? Just a bunch of old Windows 8 licenses, Windows seven, right? You guys have, have this at home, don't you? Well, maybe you do or maybe you don't, but I just wanted to share something that I have been doing somewhat recently when I have a new system set up and I want to install Windows 10 on it and then I want to activate it with a digital license. Rather than going to Kingwin and paying them potentially for a license that I need to activate over the phone, I've just been going through my old archive of Windows 8 keys and I have a decent amount of them thanks to former jobs and stuff, but I've just been plugging in the old keys, even if they were activated on a system five, six, seven years ago, and a lot of them have just worked. I have no idea how the inner workings of Microsoft's activation system work. All I know is apparently maybe there's some sort of purge going on at some point where they say, all right, if the keys are old enough, they just reset and they can be used again. I'm not sure, but just sort of a PSA to you guys out there. If you have old keys used on old systems and you're trying to set up a new system, maybe try that old key out and just see if it happens to activate. Here's another SSD question from Chimita Uda. I think I got that right. Uh, hey Paul, I saw somewhere on the internet that SSDs aren't ideal for long-term storage because of their lack of reliability. Is it true? By the way, I love your videos. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for the encouraging words. I also have heard information like this and I think most of this is just old data. Uh, when SSDs first came out, uh, they were a little bit less reliable, uh, in some ways significantly less reliable than they are now. In particular, there were some specific brands and specific models of SSDs that became very popular. OCC's Vector drive is certainly one of those. Uh, and those, unfortunately, uh, because they had a higher than average failure rate, put out the impression among people that SSDs might be less reliable than mechanical storage. Two things to point out about SSD reliability. Uh, one is that the NAND flash that the SSDs are built on will have a certain amount of times it can be uh, written to. Once it's hit that limit, it does not become unreadable. It goes to what's called steady state, in which point it becomes read only. So you can still read the data off of the drive, even if you cannot necessarily utilize that NAND anymore for read and write operations. So there is the potential for data recovery with an SSD. That said, flip side is that the controller, in my experience, is what usually dies, not the NAND itself. 
And if the controller dies, your drive is pretty much dead. You're not gonna be able to get any of the data off of that, at least not without going and paying some uh, expensive data recovery uh, service for it. So fortunately though, the drives that had high incidences of controllers dying have all been phased out. And to my knowledge, there are no current drives being sold by any of the major companies that are reputable uh, that have that reputation. Any drive that you get, whether it's mechanical or solid state can drive and you can lose data. That's just sort of part of how things go. That's why you should always have your data stored in more, more than one place. But by and large, this reputation for SSDs having not long-term reliability is, is sort of an artifact of the past five or 10 years of SSD development and not necessarily something you should be worried about today. Just a few more questions. Here's one from Karthik Rajan who says, hey Paul, is there any way to only remove Windows 10 from the SSD, keeping all of your personal files untouched? I don't want to go through the hassle of backing up data. No. This is, I brought this, I, I wanted to answer this question because I thought it was interesting. I always have lots of people who are like, I have my Windows 10 drive, can I reuse it? Or move it to another drive or something like that. This is the first time I've been asked, can I take my Windows 10 SSD and remove the Windows 10 off of it, but leave all the personal data? Just no, there's no way to my knowledge to do that. There might be third party software or something that can try to handle backup duties for you. You just, you need to get to some level of comfortability with backing up your data. Know where the files are stored on your computer and back them up regularly. Have a list of the programs you have installed so you can reinstall them if you go with a clean install. It would potentially be a great idea, I suppose, but uh, does not exist to my knowledge. Merkfiend87 asks, when did you first meet Bitwit, uh, or Kyle as he is also known, and how did y'all become such good friends? Uh, it's, it's a long story, Merkfiend, but uh, goes back to Newegg. Actually, I was working at Newegg. We had started the YouTube channel uh, back in the day in like 2010 or something like that. Kyle joined, I believe, in 2011, uh, and then he started helping out with the channel, originally doing some behind the scenes stuff, then he would do some on-camera stuff. Uh, we did Yoked for quite some time. There's the first episode of Yoked and Kyle looking super young, super green. One of the first events we did though that kind of stands out in my mind was a trip we did to Dallas. Uh, it was just three of us on that trip. And uh, I just remember that being a trip where we like we we had one day where we didn't have anything to do in the afternoon. It was just insanely hot. So we literally just drove around in a car for like a few hours because we didn't have anything else to do and just talked and got to know each other a little bit better. So I remember that as kind of being the first time I felt like I got to know Kyle. Funny story, when he actually interviewed at Newegg, I wasn't there at the time. I watched his interview video and my first impression was like, nah, I don't think we should, <laughs> I don't think we should hire him. Fortunately, I was overruled because uh, Kyle joined Newegg. Uh, we became friends. And then uh, when he decided he wanted to leave and do his own thing, kind of made me think, oh, maybe I should do that too. And then we both left at the same time. It was great. If you guys want, uh, what in my opinion is us sort of, when we moved from like acquaintances to being better friends, Go watch Yoked episode 12, which has this great exchange right yeah, at the so beginning. First off, Paul, I really like your shirt. Where'd you get it? Oh, thank you, Kyle. I got it at BlizzCon 2011. Ah, you know, if I was wearing an AMD shirt right now, we could have a sword fight. Well, that would be fun, Kyle, but I warn you, I have a lot of swordplay experience, and I think you'd go down pretty quick. Uh, not if I snuck it behind you and stuck you first. Well, we can save that for a future episode, but now let's move on to tech news. And the final question for today from Scott. He says, question, you're a hairy mofo, and what do you look like when you grow out your beard? I'm thinking Wolfman, thanks, Paul. Joe, Joe likes this question. He thinks it's pretty funny. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a hairy. I have lots of arm hair. Um, sometimes I tend to it. Other times I just let it grow wild. Uh, but if you want to know what I look like with a beard, uh, you're in luck because right now it's October. Next month is November or November beard. And although I didn't have any like specific goal in mind for the past couple years, I have grown my beard out in November and even kept it to a little bit into December. And speaking of this announcement from 2018, Charity Livestream we're doing another one. This isn't the right date and everything, so don't look at that. But we are gonna do that again this year. And at the end of last year's charity live stream, and although I was super, super strung out from like a 12 hour live stream and, and lack of sustenance and other stuff like that, I did take the time at the very end of the stream to shave my beard off. Anyway though guys, I'll put links uh, where relevant to videos and other stuff I've talked about in today's video. And if you want to ask me a question to be answered next month in November, then please leave it in the comment section down below. Thank you guys so much. Heroes down here rubbing up against my legs. <laughs> so, but that's gonna do it for this episode of Probing Paul. Thanks again so much for watching guys and we'll see you next time.